Howdy, howdy. Ooh, howdy. And welcome to... But it was aliens. Stop, ah. stop stealing my line. But it was aliens. <laughs> the extraterrestrial comedy podcast where we probe actual alien occurrences. Be that alien, UFO, UAP, Predator, Xenomorph, E.T., Paul, Alf, Marvin, Gilbert, or anyone responsible for Men in Black International. Out of those films you just named, which is the worst of those films? Men in Black International. What's the best? Oh, you, you, you're not going to agree with me. No, I'm not. Can I just take Men in Black? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say Alien or Aliens, but you're going to say Predator. I'm not. I was going to say Aliens. Oh, I think Aliens. Is I think the Aliens film. is generally renowned as the better film, but I just Predator. love. I love Men in Black. Not Men in Black International. <laughs> is the better alien? Yeah. Should probably introduce ourselves, shouldn't I mean, we? I had a pet. I'm going to come back to that. I'm hosting today's episode and I'm Kevin the Grey. And I am Moonwalker. Moonwalker. I walk on the moon. Right, well, I guess I won't introduce you then. <laughs> you said Predator as a pet, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Was, it, was it Predator or Xenomorph? I've gone blank. Predator. That strikes me as a very bad idea. I imagine that you would be the pet. No. You're thinking that through and you're coming to that realisation <laughs> yourself. <laughs> you're picturing the predator behind you sticking it to you. No, I'm picturing the predator. Behind you. On a rooftop. Behind you, Literally nude. guarding me. By any guarding, t- any you mean gripping you. Mo- any motherfucker steps to me, that predator's like... <laughs> Later. The only person stepping to you is the predator, <laughs> my friend. Would you be predator's bitch if it meant protection? I think I'd choose death. Me too. <laughs> That's got to be like the grimmest. <laughs> I'm not even going to get into it. Anyway, what we do here each week is take it in turns to present a case to each other to determine whether the case really did involve aliens. Today, we are returning to Stonehenge. Stonehenge. Or are we? Well, we are going there, but not there, so to speak. Because there's another Stonehenge, Good Walker of Moons. And this Stonehenge has also seen aliens. It wasn't built by Merlin, no. Neither was the other one. For we are off to North Bergen. New Jersey in the US of A. So firstly, I want to know, what happened to old Jersey? What did happen to old Jersey? Also, what happened to old York? So when the pilgrims went to settle America, they often named places after the English places. So York in England is essentially old York. Ah, like you've got Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I can't think of a Jersey. So in... they. So what you're saying is they not only copied the language, copied the language. <laughs> they took the language with them because they were predominantly from here and a little bit of Dutch. Yeah. They, well, I forget which ship it was now, but um, they went via Hol- well the Netherlands for a little bit, didn't they? A couple of years, and they went on over to America. And had to eat their bags and shoes and whatnot to stay alive. North Bergen, Hudson County, has a population upwards of 60,000 people and was the town of residence for Cinderella man James J. Braddock when he won the boxing world heavyweight title from Max Baer. North Bergen is also the location of Stonehenge, a residential apartment complex on Boulevard East Woodcliffe, constructed in 1967 as a block of 356 apartments. It's big and cylinder shaped. I've slapped a photo onto the research notes here for you, but we don't need to discuss it. That's just for your reference, Mr. Mooney. Now, are you ready to head back to January the 12th 1975 do we have the reason why it was named Stonehenge no it strikes me that that would have been a really intelligent thing to look up (laughs) 
I didn't. Because we're operating on a plane above that. On a plane above intelligence. Yes. Hyper-intelligence, if you will. <laughs> I don't know whether it's just named for the shits and giggles, because it doesn't really look like Stonehenge, though I suppose it's massive, and maybe they were just going for the, the old size. Possibly. Whenever you say Cinderella Man, all I can think of is um, the Eminem song, Cinderella Man. Ah. Oddly, it's on my... Um, Jim, workout playlist. I've got to say, I was expecting that you were going to say that you could only think of Cinderella. Didn't even cross my mind. Interesting. So, it's January the 12th. It's 2.45. Is it? Is it January 12th or was it January 12th? I'm taking you back there. So we're just travelling through time at the moment. Okay. It's January the 12th. God, it's cold. It's 2.45 in the morning. A liquor store owner by the name of George O'Barsky was driving through... Brad- was he driving through or is he driving through? I mean, you've taken us back. <laughs> I've taken us back now, so now we're <laughs> reflecting on it. Oh, okay. Keep up. Come on. <laughs> George O'Barsky was driving through Braddock Park when his radio filled with static... Static. I mean, when your radio fills up with static, it's not really like anything unusual, is it? Usually I means mean, you're going through a tunnel in this country. That can, yeah, or you've just hit an area where there's just not a good reception. When was the last time you hit an area where there wasn't good reception? I live out <laughs> in the fucking sticks. <laughs> if I drive to work and I'm late, I don't plug my phone in. I just stick the radio on and drive and then sometimes you'll just pass through a pocket and it'll just go <coughs> Kevin is an asshole <coughs> and then before you know it you're back to your music Ah, uh, that's interesting because I don't live out in the sticks what you're saying is you live in the, like the land before time yes do they even have cars there I do do you ride a dinosaur I'm one of the lucky ones I pick it up Fred Flintstone style and run. <laughs> it wouldn't even surprise me. And then you turn on the radio and you hear, <laughs> George <laughs> leant forward to fiddle with the radio. As he did, something light caught his peripheral vision. George looked to his side, and to his shock, caught sight of an object in the sky approximately 30 feet in width, and maybe 6 feet in height? The craft, let's call it. No, actually, let's call it the definite UFO I'm saying that it was Aliens craft, was above a field by the Stonehenge complex. The definite UFO I'm saying that it was Aliens craft was round and dark, but had brightly lit windows. George also noticed that he could hear a humming sound, like this. Michael bullshit then. Whoa, 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 that's early. Right, do you know what? You call me the sceptical negative bastard. I've been listening back to some of our episodes. It's not that way at all. I think you find it is that way. It's not. You're like, I call bullshit. I call bullshit. You sound like bullshit. I don't believe him. Bullshit. One, terrible impression. Two, I think you'll find I only call bullshit when it's bullshit. And I am 100% of the time correct. So, that doesn't mean you're not positive and negative. I've confused myself. Can you really call me negative if I'm correct? Yes. Because you could encourage the story. Be jolly for our listeners. Hey Siri, I call bullshit. They're welcome to believe what they wish. So around UFO sounds pretty much like a typical case of bullshit. Whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. Um, can you call it by its proper name, please? Bullshit. The definite UFO I'm saying that it was Aliens Craft. Okay, the definite UFO that I'm not going to complete the rest of this sentence. 
Whoa. Raft. Sir. Um, the humming he was hearing. Hum. Was it his radio caused by the craft nearby? Could have or been. Or was it the craft itself humming? At this point, we don't know. Like, did he turn the radio if, off? If I could see open. a craft, I'm going to assume that's the craft this happened to me. See, because I would the check. radio is already static. I would turn it down and then um, open the windows and see if I can still hear it. Fair. I mean, his car could also be fucking up. So also fair. Could be the tyres. Sometimes I see this weird little ticking sound when I drive and it really fucking annoys me. And it's all because there's a stone in the tyre. Oh. <laughs> Drives me mental. I was about to say, maybe it. you shouldn't be driving. <laughs> Just do a check underneath the car next time. <laughs> They're on to you. They're only letting you live because you keep on <laughs> shitting on all our cases. <laughs> they keep thinking you know the details. <laughs> then you're like, no. Nope. That's why I woke up with that bruise that one time. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little bit too close. You're too close. So in having the radio turn to static and in seeing a damn straight up definite UFO I'm saying that it was aliens craft, what do you do? What George did was get closer. George slowed down but continued heading towards the craft. As George neared the field, less than 100 feet away, a panel appeared to open between two windows. George was by the edge of the field now and could make out what appeared to be a ladder drop from the panel or hatch. Guess what's going to come out of the hatch, son? <laughs> a floaty little alien, just like in the Colonel episode. <laughs> going to hop out the top and just float down like Mary Poppins. One of the bouncy ones. And he's going to pop out going, I'm Mary Poppins, yo! <laughs> hey, yo! <laughs> I got a really deep voice where I come from. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. <laughs> They're really butch, but with a really high-pitched voice. What you looking at, yo? I'ma mess you up if you come at me. What is gonna come out of the hatch? Not a grey. It's gonna be something that we've... I'm not gonna say not seen before, but something we're not expecting. Like a human's gonna come out of it. Ooh. That would be quite unusual, wouldn't it? Exactly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> how bad is it that a human come out of the craft on this show is considered unusual? What? A human? A five foot ten human is going to come out of this craft, and he's going to wave and go, "Hello, all right, how you doing?" He's going to say it's from the future. Yeah, from the future. That's my prediction. So the ladder dropped and down popped not one, not two, not even three, but ten little figures all wearing the same one-piece white outfits with little hoods. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes, sir? Whoa. Yes? Whoa. How little? <laughs> uh, we're talking, I mean, I'll get into it in a minute, but very little. Okay. Up to about your waist height, I'd say. But like I say, we'll get into it more specifically in a little bit. Are these KKK aliens? KKK aliens. I mean, am I gonna have to fuck some aliens up? <laughs> you might want to bring your predator along. <laughs> They're like a little cult, regardless. In their little hoods. The hoods obscured the little figures' faces, but these little dwarf mother truckers each held an object that looked to George like a spoon. Little people in snowsuits holding spoons. Where are they sticking their spoons? Are these... The Nunes boys? No. Um, are these Alakazams in snowsuits? <laughs> <laughs> You've gone Pokemon. Yep. As you're wearing a Pokemon shirt today, <laughs> I can see why you'd go there. So I was thinking of previous cases we've covered where they tried to sample dirt and whatnot, but no, you're going Pokemon. Mm -hmm. To be fair, yours exists. I was also going to say, are these um, different versions of Tombreys, where they don't have a knife and a lantern, but they have a snowsuit and a spoon. We're going to eat your ass. <laughs> your ass. <laughs> they follow you to the edge of the earth. You can't escape. With the high-pitched voices, remember? Slowly well, hey, walk after you. I'm going to eat your ass. <laughs> oh, no. Imagine it just constantly comes after you. 
Like you can never escape. Really it. wants to eat your ass. It just keeps coming <laughs> after you. You can always outwalk it. It's got the type of rumblies that only an ass can but it's satisfy. Just there. <laughs> Show me that ass. <laughs> Snow White's little three-foot helpers, all one by one, stuck their spoons into the ground and then placed the contents of their spoons into little bags each were carrying. They appeared to be taking samples of the dirt, but then they appeared startled and rushed back towards the craft and up the ladder. It was all over within less than five minutes. The craft shot up at ridiculous speed and vanished pretty much instantly. Poof! George was astonished. I, in learning this, immediately looked up in my notes from past episodes. This is strikingly similar to the Hairy Dwarves of Venezuela from 1954, which we covered in episode 34. I was going to say that it's not the first time we've heard of... um like a species of alien collecting samples. Yeah, yeah. It's been um, at least one other, possibly two others. Yeah, you've got the hairy dwarfs, and then we've got um, old Lonnie Zamora, when Maurice found them in France, and they were in his fields. Ah. And he said they had Maurice. something, and it looked like they were taken from the ground. Good and memory, then they fucked sir. his legs up. <laughs> but we've covered so many cases at this point. We're nearly at 100, and they kind of just... Unless there's something really extravagant like the brains or Huggins banging the aliens. I'm not going to lie, I totally forgot about the brains. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, those ones stick in my mind when there's something really, really unusual or something just downright hilarious like um, Stephanie Cohen, the uh, reincarnated. Best, <laughs> Best episode. <laughs> yeah, that might well be my favourite. I'm going to go back and listen again. <laughs> Yeah, they all kind of mould into one, so it's really hard. Like, sometimes people will ask me, what's what's the best case you've covered? Or what's what's the most legitimate case you've covered? And I just go blank, because I'm like, I just don't know. The one with Mrs. Granville, when she shit her pants. <laughs> go listen to that one, and that one only. Aye. Good old Pembrokeshire. Prick. <laughs> That's still one of my favourites. Just for that moment, I was so excited when I was doing the research. Sat there writing the whole thing with a smile on my face, knowing that I was going to get you to that point. (laughs) Bet you got a boner, didn't you? Yes. George went home, but then curiosity got the better of him. He kept thinking about the little people. How they looked. How quickly they moved. How they smelt. How they felt. How they looked. I was about to say how they looked. <laughs> You've already said that. <laughs> how they looked. How quickly they moved. How they looked. <laughs> George thought he was going crazy. So George just had to do it. He had to know. George went back to the field later that morning. George studied the ground where the craft had landed, and to his shock, George did indeed find little holes all over the place. It had actually happened. By the way, I should just add that George has now passed away, and his son maintains that George had been robbed at the store several times, and he was unflappable. The only time Frank had ever seen his dad George scared was when he came home after this experience. Hmm. Holes all over the field. Mole holes. Nope. Um, there was no dog trios around. I mean, why Why would he even be scared at this point? They're gone. Yeah, but it's after he came home after the initial experience. Oh, so he so came that's back the only time that he's and been he was scared. shit scared. Yeah, he crapped his Pissed pants. Pissed his pants. Yeah, pretty much. And then decided, I'm going to go back. He thought about it, no, and to he be thought fair, about it, and cur- the next day, curiosity got the better of him. I thought he was... I oh, also went back the next day, didn't go back the same night. Uh, no, it was later that morning. So. Did he not take anyone with him just to check? Did he not tell his son of the story, and then uh, let's go and see if there's these holes there? No. So he went on his own? He didn't want to put them at risk. So what you mean to tell me <laughs> is that he didn't want anyone there that can cooperate his story? I mean nothing, sir. Don't bring me into this. <laughs> I'm merely recounting the tale of George to you. So you're merely telling me... I'm merely telling you that George went back and this all happened. And he didn't take anyone with him. 
to corroborate his story. He may not have taken anyone with him. All right. Okay. Oh, so now he may not have. <laughs> Let's just think about this. He's thinking that couldn't have happened. That couldn't have happened. I would. Right, he's feeling bonkers. No, let, let's he put wants it to go and verify. Let's put it this way. If that had happened to me, just just taking a big drink. I would go. I'd call you up. Yeah, but not everyone go, has a friend like me. Jism. <laughs> the craziest <laughs> shit has just happened. I'd just like let's to go check it out. I'd just like to add, despite <laughs> me being called Jism in your phone, I think that's actually the first time you ever called me Jism. <laughs> it's actually not. <laughs> It's the first time in a long time. Uh, Might be the first time in like 10 years, though. <laughs> Do you know what you're in my phone as? G. Cranville. <laughs> well, aren't you boring? <laughs> I'm a good friend. <laughs> so am I. I respect you and call you by your name. You moose wanker. <laughs> I respect you and call you a twat. That's so how you can tell I'm a friend. Uh, I feel like we've got sidetracked a little bit here. Yeah, so on to George not taking anyone with him to corroborate his story. Yeah. Went on his own. But he's thinking this might not have happened. I don't want to be a, like seen as bonkers. I can still check. But then he finds the holes in the floor. Ooh. So now he knows. And what's he going to do next? Nothing. He's not going to take anyone. He's just going to tell his story and just right. hope everyone believes him. George went about his life for a few days. He didn't want to tell his story. People wouldn't believe him. They'd say he was a kook. But eventually, George couldn't keep it to himself any longer. Bud Hopkins just so happened to be a regular at George's liquor store, and so was a well-known acquaintance of George. As Bud had mentioned that he was interested in UFOs. So as I said, eventually, George let the winky out of the budgie smugglers. <sighs> Bud Hopkins, eh? Mm-hmm. Heard that name before, haven't we? Yeah, he's he's been around. So? Usually with the more legitimate cases. What you mean to tell me? I mean so nothing, who, sir. who let this story out? Now that we know that Bud Hopkins is involved, is this Bud Hopkins' tale of what happened to George? Or is this George's tale of what happened? Well, but I'll consider. Well, well, well. Well, George, I reserve judgment. Right now, I'm just going to wait until the story ends before I say anything else. Okay, sir. <laughs> Bud reported the UFO story to the village voice because, yes, Bud was a ufologist and this was perhaps the story that sent him down the path of alien abductions he would later work with. Bud Hopkins investigated this story and met a doorman from the Stonehenge apartments named William Paulowski, who, would you believe it, also saw the craft. William saw what he described as strange floating lights at the exact same time as George's own sighting. Not only that, but when the craft took off, a large glass window in the lobby of Stonehenge shattered. <laughs> Bitch. Do we have proof of that? We may. There was nothing else at the scene that could have broken the window. It just shattered as the craft took off. There's more. Another doorman, Bill Dallies, reported seeing a UFO at the same time in the same field three days earlier. Dallies didn't even know about the other reports when spoken to. Another doorman, Francisco Gonzalez, was also tracked down and confirmed seeing a craft in the same area. Bud also spoke with a family who saw the flying disc. Multiple witnesses over a period of days with nothing to gain. The town was a buzz. All the local children begun talking about what some had seen. Some even claimed to have seen rings and scorch marks in the field. Evidence, baby. Bud has um, quite a knack for finding people to uh, cooperate a story, doesn't he? Bud gets in deep. I mean, whether these uh, these people hadn't mentioned anything before, they'd all just kept quiet and then 
all of a sudden they're happy to speak to Bud. Well, they might have been talking to each other, just we don't know about that until Bud got involved. And Bud kind of found them all and brought all their stories together. Bud went looking for witnesses, yeah. He picked up all the strings and put them together. So you could say he spun a yarn. N- no. What he did was more like he got a board and he started marking where all these sightings were and he put string between the sightings and verified it all and tracked the movement and knew his shit. So with all the bits of string that he pulled, (laughs) could you possibly spin a yarn with them? No, it wasn't long enough. Okay. Bet Bud could. He was more into knitting. So, um... No questions, sir! About the uh, large glass window... That yes, shattered. Absolutely. And nothing else could have possibly shattered it. Nothing. I've had that happen. What so, large window? Yep. I was at work one so it was around Christmas time. I was the only person in the gym. Mm-hmm. Everyone had gone. Um the rest of the staff were you downstairs. Did it, didn't you? And in the pool. Right. And um I was standing by the desk and I heard this loud bang. Hum? Was in- it a hum? So there was a loud bang in the gym. What's there now? I was like, (laughs) what the fuck was that? I go and look. Nothing's fallen over. No seat has dropped down. Nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So, shitting my pants, I go downstairs and I ask the manager to um, check CCTV to see if anything moves in there. Mm -hmm. She goes... I think there's a ghost. And I was like, yes. well, I fucking heard something and nothing's out of place. Checks the CCTV, nothing. Mm-hmm. She goes, do you want me to come upstairs and hold your hand? I was like, well, you can come upstairs and fucking check. <laughs> <laughs> so we go upstairs, we check in the gym, nothing's falling, nothing's mm-hmm. down. And then all of a sudden we start hearing this crackling sound. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Pull the blind back. The whole glass panel for the gym window shattered. Like, completely as if it's been hit with something. A craft took off nearby. So, um. You've so been probed. We check the CCTV outside to see if any little shits have thrown anything at the window. Nothing. No one goes past. Nothing caught on camera hitting it. A couple of days later, um window guy comes out to repair it and he says that something hit it from the inside he said it's been there's an impact from the inside somewhere that caused it to shatter I was the only fucker in that gym son you did it (laughs) you were lifting and you got a bit carried away I wasn't even lifting Uh, I was reading an article on lifting (laughs) So two possibilities. A window, fact, three possibilities, can shatter on its own. Something there is that. no Either craft. Aliens, and you've been probed. You did it. <laughs> what with my mind? <laughs> or there's a ghost. Which one are you going for? Probably ghost, because she did mention you mention you work with a ghost. She did mention when she takes her dog in there, or when mm-hmm. she used to take her dog in there to lock up. It was fine everywhere in the gym, but it wouldn't go down the back stairs. Yes. I've fucking yes. been down those back stairs on my own at night, son. Oh, I hope you see it one day. <laughs> Oddly, so do I. But at the same time, I fucking leg it up those stairs. <laughs> I hope Try I'll... and talk to it. No. Do it. So, yes, a glass... Window can shatter. I do not believe it just randomly happened. Well, we know what the three possibilities are. So it could have been a ghost at Stonehenge, or it could have been someone in the lobby. That's a different take. Or it could have been some little shits going past, you know. And this... why one window, not multiple? Good question. This all culminated on February the 22nd. When a UFO appearance took place during the hours of day. Again, a disc-like object was seen during heavy rain above the park by a few witnesses. A one-off sighting, okay, maybe someone's on drugs or drunk or whatever, looking for a moment in the spotlight. Maybe it's a coincidence of shooting stars even. 
that so many sightings all in the same area of the same thing? We're getting deep into the realms of credibility now. The only difficulty is this is 1975. Not everyone has a camera in their pocket. With the sightings lasting minutes, by the time anyone can get there, they're gone. What Only to have been seen by those present in the moment. What a coincidence. Coinky dink. I was going to ask if you had uh, some visual proof. Turns out you don't. You should just never ask and wait for it. Nah. <laughs> so just to go over one further detail. There are a couple more witnesses I haven't mentioned who asked to remain anonymous, but they too all reported the same thing in the same areas. There are a lot of independently verified sightings of this one. Nobody involved was deemed to be anything less than credible. George himself was a reputable chap for the rest of his life and never claimed to see anything again, just this one time. These um, other people that came forward but asked to remain anonymous. Yeah. Did they come forward of their own accord or did they come forward according to Bud? They came forward. Sometimes you should just be satisfied in life. Like, you don't need anything more. I want it all. (laughs) Okay, well, at this point, I guess I should ask, is there more? Oh, no, 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 that wasn't the whole story, my friend. Four years later, Bud, deep into ufology now, returned to North Bergen and spoke with a local, Harrod... Harrod? (laughs) Harrods. Harold Stiff. (laughs) Harold reported to Bud that he was driving through Braddock Park when his car stopped dead in its tracks, illuminated in a spotlight. Bud was now Fox Mulder and needed to know the truth. Did he run out of petrol? I can't confirm (laughs) why it happened. Did he hit a pothole? Did he emergency Mm. brake for a deer? No, he definitely didn't do that. Did he emergency brake for a moose? No. Why did he emergency brake? <laughs> I'm not saying that he did emergency brake. Why did he stop? Right. To describe this second sighting in the same area, Harold's son Robert told the story to the Hudson Reporter in 2007. Robert would explain that, and I'm not quoting so much as summarising here, that Harold was on his way home and as he turned to the park, the car cut out. Dead. Radio? Dead. Engine? Dead. A bright light suddenly came through the top of the car and some strange voices, almost like a language Harold had never heard before, came through the radio. Harold then noticed that the light was actually some sort of craft. A panel opened and little grey men with big eyes came out. Suddenly the door closed and the craft flew off. Harold thought it had been ten minutes in total, maybe less. But when he came home, it was actually three hours later. Harold's wife, Robert's mother, was not happy. Bud believes that Harold was abducted that night. Of course he does. I believe... Harold was off doing something else and used use this as an excuse. But if, 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 and this is a very, very big if, like this if is probably the size of the Stonehenge building itself in New Jersey. If this did happen, mm-hmm. we've gone from 10 mini KKK aliens <laughs> to um, Grey's. I mean, what's the what's the pecking order here? Well, they could be tiny greys. People do often report small greys. Yeah, but they're not in their little KKK. Or maybe suits. they took off their suits. So they're showing their real faces. Maybe. Hmm. There's a tiny bit more still. Full disclosure, I've only read about this. I didn't want to listen so as to not rip off the story, so I'll listen after we've recorded this, but Joe Rogan had comedian Joey Diaz on his show. 
Diaz talks a lot in his routines about his drugged up stories from the 70s, admittedly. But he grew up in this area and on the show he talks about the North Bergen UFO. Diaz remembers the whole park being locked up the day after the sightings. There were many witnesses who all saw the flashing lights. Diaz himself didn't believe it but went for a bike ride to check it out and saw loads of people in orange suits investigating the park. No wonder he moved on to drugs. But the key takeaway here is that there aren't many public records on this one, but we know that it was indeed investigated by people in hazard protective suits, like a scene from freaking E.T. Could it be possible that simply something fell from space, like a meteorite, and they were literally there? Hard up. to explain the figures but, with the spoons. Yeah, but they're not real, are they? Well, they could be. I mean, he could have been drinking, he could have been on drugs. But he might not we have been. We actually haven't covered that. Was he sober when all that happened? He was young, yeah. Young and sober. <laughs> oh, was- I mean, this is a Bud Hopkins story, and it's Bud recounting, so... Um, but yeah, Diaz does say he went and saw it. That doesn't mean to say that there was a UFO sighting. He could have been putting two and two together and making sandwiches. He could have seen an alien. I doubt that. Well, I doubt he was putting two and two together and making sandwiches. I mean, he saw people in uh, orange suits. He might have seen some uh, convicts doing some work in the park, cleaning that up. It's pretty hard to mistake a hazmat suit. He was young. He's taken loads of drugs. Maybe it's distorted his memory of this event. Maybe it hasn't. Maybe you're picking holes where there are none. Or maybe I'm picking holes where there should be holes. You're trying to catch on to a loose thread and you just can't get it. You can't get it. (laughs) Did you get it? I'm trying to... uh, Derail. Unravel (laughs) this yarn that is being spun. I think you're a plant. (laughs) You fucking sequoia. (laughs) I won't get into detail for fear of ruining future probes, but Hudson County, and more widely, New Jersey, is considered a UFO hotspot. But for the incident George witnessed, MUFON and the Centre for UFO Studies, KUFOS, founded by J. Allen Hynek of Close Encounters, Kale and Project Blue Book consultant fame, investigated it. KUFOS... On page 15 of their investigation, yes, I've accessed the files to paraphrase, liken George's case to opening Pandora's box. The location is described as a repeater for UFO manifestations, and this true story is the tip of the iceberg. I've included the link at the top of the research notes here if you ever want to read it, though obviously not now, and I'll place the link in the show notes for those curious. I should just clarify that I read this summary after I'd already completed the research notes, so we haven't just ripped off QFOS here. I'm linking them purely because I found it interesting and deep-dived myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Pandora's box. Yep. If they would have said that Area 51 and... New Mexico was a site of, like, not Pandora's box, but that case would have been lifting the lid on Pandora's box and blah, blah, blah. I would have accepted it. Although I would have called bullshit. So I wouldn't have accepted it. Mm -hmm. I mean, naming this place as likening it to Pandora's box when it is complete bullshit is oh, it's just a shitty move. How? Such I've a, given you so many such a witnesses. Shitty move. What the hell? Yeah, has... but you've given me Bud's witnesses, and it's come from Bud. Not every case These... that Bud has covered is bullshit. Son, right now, until we do any future probes where there's the possibility that Bud Hopkins could be telling the truth, this is bullshit. <laughs> this is the one. <laughs> You're only ruling it out because it involves Bud. I've given you a bunch of witnesses, verified sightings. Pandora's box, though. (laughs) That's taking it a step too far. Never. If they would have said Pandora's drawer 
or like Pandora's kitty hatch. Fair. But they've named the whole box. It's the whole box. <sighs> You're such a sceptical bastard. But I'm not. <laughs> you are. <laughs> so sceptical. Oh, Pandora's box is a step too far. <laughs> no. There could be so many Pandora's box cases that you haven't heard of. This is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> The truth. I'm, I'm, we speak I'm, the truth today. I'm not going to lie. I have been soured by the stench of Bud Hopkins on this case. I think everyone listening will have realised that. <laughs> You're going to have to bring something new to bring me over. Okay, well, because well, on that note, we previously covered Betty and Barney Hill. And we... Uh, wait, wait for it. I'm, I'm not going to say what we said. Yeah. But because we concluded on a that. story about their story was released on the 20th of October 1975 George contacted Bud Hopkins about a month after this Hopkins book Intruders much like Whitley Strieber's book Communion topped the New York Times best sellers list in 1987 Bud also published Missing Time a documented study of UFO abductions around 1981. These books pushed alien abduction stories into mainstream culture. Bud Hopkins, though, was of course an absolute believer and had not been abducted himself. He studied other people's experiences and wrote about many in his books. Bud took this very seriously and wasn't interested in bullshit. Bud would even go on to examine hypnotists for eight years and develop his own form of hypnotism exclusively to use with abduction victims. He believed that aliens didn't understand or simply didn't care about the psychological trauma they left behind. Bud went deep on an awful lot, so I won't get into Bud too deeply myself. I just wanted to touch base on him. I mean, you're telling me about this stuff about Bud after we've already covered Bud. <laughs> I am, yes. So, uh, We've covered Bud several times, but it's hard to remember, so I'm refreshing everyone's minds. His own form of uh, hypnotism. Yeah, I remember he studied. Bud shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't called Bud shit. He took an L. He took two L's and called it Bud shit. I mean, you can see why he hasn't tried to say that he himself has been abducted, because then that is just taking it a little bit too far. He wanted to keep that little bit of realism. Bud was an honest believer. Insane. He just believed like, it all. Because if he would have been abducted as well, then people would go, oh, he's just a quack. But the fact that he hasn't been kind of adds a sense of... Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Credibility. Bullshit. But yeah, credibility to his tales. Well, not his tales, but what he's saying about other people. I mean, he... I mean, I don't believe it, but... Whoa. Others will. I mean, Buddhists. <laughs> if that's what we call them. Buddhism. One day you're going to be a Buddhist. <laughs> right. Uh, you already called me a plant. Maybe you'll bud someday. <laughs> One day. We can only hope. To summarise, we've had George Obarski driving home from work at 2.45. George goes his usual route through Braddock Park but sees a UAP in the sky. George follows it to a field where it lands near Stonehenge and 10 aliens in onesies hop out. The aliens spoon up dirt from the ground and then rush back into their craft, taking off with a hum at unfathomable speed. This hum sound shatters glass within the Stonehenge lobby. The events are witnessed by several others. The next day, the field is investigated by folks in hazard suits. The craft had been seen by lots of people over a several day period. Four years later, Harold Stiff may have been abducted in the same place. Bud Hopkins investigates it all as he becomes obsessed with finding the truth about alien abductions. Mufon investigates it too. So do Kufos. They deem that this one was indeed aliens and is the tip of the iceberg in terms of activity in this area. Do you have any final points before we conclude? You know people that work for uh, Mufon and Kufos? Yeah. Do you reckon they get paid? Some of them. So 
I mean, it's their job to go and investigate everything that's said, otherwise they wouldn't get paid. Is that correct? I wouldn't say that. I reckon a lot of it is voluntary by people who live in the area, but I reckon there's like a, a structure or a hierarchy, including paid employees. So, uh, Bud. Mm-hmm. Bud a member of any of these? I can't remember myself. He is a Buddhist. He's the leader. But also, Bud has sold a couple of books, hasn't he? He has, yeah. Made a bit of money from this. He, it's a passion for him. In the uh, so, think about this very are carefully. You telling me that he's made no profit from any of these books. I'm not telling you that, but it's a passion for him, and he's turning it into business. So, what do we do? What he's <laughs> saying, yes, is that he is going out there. He's spinning yarns. Well, he lived around this one. He's spinning yarns. Justify telling that. people it's the truth and then writing a book about it to make some profit he's in the covering, height of he's known to cover would you say the 70s and the 80s was a height of um, sci-fi I'd say the 80s yeah easier yeah. mm, that was roughly when his books came out is that correct roughly so uh he's riding the wave of sci-fi He's got a passion for it and bringing it to the forefront of culture. I mean, he might have a passion for it. Passion for making money. Passion for aliens. Do you like the gym? Like a passion for sci-fi. Do you like the gym? Yes, I do. And are you making money via gyms? Yes. But I'm not lying to people. Bud doesn't think he's lying. He's a genuine believer. Oh, Bud's lying. It's fine for you to think it's not true. Bud's lying. You can't doubt that Bud believes. I highly doubt. I don't doubt that Bud believes. I just doubt the bed, the bedability, <laughs> the budability, the credibility of ninety-five percent of Bud's stories. I think there's still one out there. We're yet to find it. This isn't it. This is it. This isn't <laughs> this it. This is it. But we're yet to find it. Bud has won. Uh, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you saying that it was aliens? I'm saying that this is Budism. This is Bud Aliens. spinning yarn. I reckon maybe, what's his name, George did see some weird lights. He might have seen a tractor in a field. And what about the and, um, the many other witnesses? They and might have the seen people in hazmat and the comedian. Yeah, that might have been something totally different. It's and all the same. Bud's just same kind of area, same descriptions. Mixed it into one story. Um, I'm not saying this was aliens. I'm... I'm saying Bud has made a mountain out of a molehill. He's uh, spun yarn, many yarns. There's literally nothing in this case you can pick apart, so you're just attacking Bud as a person. <laughs> I can pick apart a lot of it. I just don't know if these other people are real. They're real. Like, has Bud made them up? Never. Are they real? Never. Are there any newspaper articles? Do we have clippings? I mean, about these people. If you want me to spend three hours on an episode, I can give you all the newspaper clippings. I mean, I would like to have seen I at covered least some one. of the reports, if you remember. I haven't seen them or newspaper articles about them. I'm going WhatsApp you like <laughs> 600 articles after this one because I haven't seen them. What do you can't think I used to write the episode? Them. I mean, you could have done a bud. <laughs> 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 you could have spun me a yarn. I can't put my reputation on the line and say this is aliens. So for me, I'm out. I'll accept your conclusion. I'm like a but dragon. I do a feel that you right haven't now. given a reason other than not liking Bud. It's not like I dislike Bud. Bud could be a nice guy. I just don't trust him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like a dragon on Dragon's Den. I'm sorry, but I'm out. That's called Shark Tank in this America, is not, isn't it? Yeah, this is not aliens. All right, I'm not saying that it was aliens, but... Hold on. After all the shit you've given me throughout this probe, <laughs> you better say that it was aliens. Right. <laughs> this one is one of those ones where I went in thinking, nope, but an hour later I'm thinking, hot damn! I'm loading up Kufos files, I'm watching historic news reports, it's so, so convincing. What's further convincing is the blanket of invisibility that covers these events. So many witnesses are involved, yet it's just swept 
under the rug and forgotten about with no official word of investigation or follow-up. As we make this show, I can feel myself gradually turning into Mulder's son. I need help! But... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a Buddhist. (laughs) (laughs) As much as there's lots of information, it all goes back to newspaper stories and there's not really a substantial amount of like interviews with people and whatnot and there was no one I could really latch on to. It's all coming from Bud. Yeah, and it just that's what I thought. I mean, I'm not saying that something didn't even happen. I just... I need other people to give me credible stuff. I could totally understand if five people had come out and you're hearing five different people's interpretations of this happening, but it's all coming from Bud. Yeah, I just feel, again, this happened in such a populated area as well that it should have been national, international news with cameras and whatnot, and it just wasn't as much as they could have swept it under the rug. I think even in the 70s, that could be quite difficult to do. Mm Mm-hmm. Someone must have had, like, a big camera somewhere. They could have photoed the people in the hazmat suits. At least that would be something. That's true. That is true. So, any final thoughts? (laughs) Buddhists. That's today's show, folks. If you'd like to probe us, we are on the Twitter at But It Was Aliens. (laughs) If you have any friends... (laughs) Uh, if you have any friends that listen to podcasts tell your friends obviously these alien probes are top secret so don't tell anyone about them but seriously tell your friends get them to give us a listen and not tell anyone about us but also tell their friends spread the word outside of that just thank you sincerely for listening to but it was aliens we'll drop a new load in your ears next week but until then oh ducks waterproof chickens with kazoos the truth is up there hash tag Brown.